A critical imperative for 2063 African Union agenda is in industrialization and trade. As we know in trade, no man is an island and no country truly stands alone. Everyone has to live somewhere. African trade, when compared to global levels, remains below its perceived potential and is particularly low when looking at intra-Africa trade. We must guide policy towards enhancing trade. We must break down the barriers that prevent trade and promote the integration of markets in order to achieve Agenda 2063. Imagine that you live in a neighborhood that has five bakeries. You are surrounded by other neighborhoods. All of the bakeries in the entire city have a common need, flour. But what if each bakery was in some way dependent on not only the flour available in their neighborhood, but also in those around it? We are going to look at geographically aggregated economic patterns, focusing primarily on aggregate price and expenditure levels within various African regions. In a simple sense, we we'll look at flour, at bread, at bakeries, at neighborhoods. So with five bakeries in one neighborhood, a lot of people are going to be buying flour to bake their bread. This drives the price of flour up, as well as showing a pattern of demand for flour in that region. And so you can prepare by ensuring that there is sufficient flour for sale, either by producing more of your own or by importing it from another neighborhood. We have two sets of data, both provided by the International Comparisons Program from 2005 and 2011. This form a basis to compare regional markets of consumption and infrastructure deficits, and we have reached these conclusions. There are discernible regional price patterns that cover a number of adjoining countries. Looking at what one neighborhood is charging for flour often gives us a good idea of what the price of flour is in the neighborhood surrounding it. There are discernible regional real expenditure patterns that cover blocks of adjoining countries. Also, by looking at what bakers in a neighborhood are spending on flour, we get a sense of what other nearby bakers will be spending too. The current regional configuration of Africa does not accurately reflect the pricing and expenditures of regional blocks. The following market concepts apply, and these are high product or service price levels in a number of adjoining countries imply lower supplies of the product or service in comparison to demand. So if our flour is expensive, economic theory suggests that it is because there is insufficient flour for the bakeries in our neighborhood. And vice versa, a low price of flour could indicate that there is a surplus of it, more flour is being made than used. Similarly, among neighboring countries, high real expenditure implies high income or price levels and hence more demand for products and services. While in another group of countries, low real expenditure implies low income or price levels and hence low demand for products and services. Poor infrastructure and conflict also have an impact on price levels. So in a neighborhood where flour is in high demand, it is likely to be more expensive. In a neighborhood where it isn't, it will be relatively cheap. Using the study, we figured out which neighborhoods were most like their neighbors, therefore creating regional consumption markets. We can now guide industrial development policy even better through interrogating prospects for regional production markets to meet their demand. Let's look at what we found. Using statistical techniques, the following underlying trends were seen. Normally, this would be unobservable looking at raw data. We now have data that shows the price of flour, not only in our neighborhood, but also in the neighborhoods surrounding it. Look at the figures below. The lowest price levels, using the grouped approach, are shown in light yellow on the left and green on the right. Price levels in 2005 were low there due to highly regulated markets, including subsidization or due to higher supplies of products relative to real expenditure and effective demand. In completely open markets with complete free flow of goods and services, these countries had a significant price advantage and the potential to export more. Their neighborhoods were making so much flour that it was cheap at the time and as such could sell flour to others if they wanted. However, the darker browns on the left and the bright yellow and red on the right show us high price levels were observed due to higher real expenditure and effective demand relative to supplies. This suggests these countries could have benefited from no barriers to trade by importing from other countries. If there are walls between your neighborhoods, preventing you from bringing in the supplies you need, 
it will be harder to get cheap flour from surrounding neighborhoods and drive prices even higher. Now, here are the same maps, but with the figures from 2011. What are the changes? How are your bakeries doing? And how are your neighbors? Because sooner or later, their welfare will in part influence yours. No man is an island. Africa needs investment in several areas. Capital formation, infrastructure, energy to name but a few. This will unlock the mobility logjam of peoples and products that inhibits Africa's progress and will allow it to realize its development potential. Without roads, how will you get flour to your bakeries? Without energy, how will you bake your bread? When one neighborhood benefits, they are draining ones too too. So if everybody is able to make a few positive increases, there will be a massive upswing for everyone. Several countries are demonstrating what is necessary to help Africa on its development path. A high gross capital formation and a high income per capita is what Africa needs to unlock its trade and stimulate industrialization for jobs and development. Nigeria is currently the biggest economy on the continent, but it has a relatively low gross domestic per capita income and a low gross capital formation compared to the two other biggest economies, South Africa and Egypt. By increasing both of these values positively, Nigeria has the potential to revitalize the West African economies. Study the other neighborhoods. See what they are doing and how you might be able to benefit from utilizing their methods. This is what the ICP data tells us, and it should play center stage in Africa's industrialization strategy. African statisticians, under the lead coordination of a pan-African institution, the African Development Bank, will collect this data annually. The trends shown by these studies are remarkable. If product prices or service prices are high, scarcity and demand have made them that way. If product prices or service prices are low, they reflect an abundance of supply. This is our central message. And yet, policy is still being made without being backed by data, when it can clearly have a beneficial impact for industrialization development policy and a program of action. The expenditure and price level information provided is available for approximately a thousand commodities. The bedrock of Africa's industrialization strategy should be a plan for a thousand expenditure items. Welfare, education, medical supplies. In short, our metaphor, flower. In closing, think outside your neighborhood. By using this data to lower the barriers to trade, we can create a continental economy, providing strength for each member. We can all prosper, but only if Africa industrializes. Only in this way can we look towards a better and brighter Africa.